Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast, starting with Rutgers Wrestling. Two big booms on Tuesday. Wrestling commits. First off, Mason Gibson, the lightweight uh, high schooler from Pennsylvania, uh, who was previously committed to Penn State. His brother is actually in that program. He was also previously committed to Cornell uh, and uh, had a great senior year, made it to the state semifinals, had over 40 wins, went 72 and 10 in his high school career. Now going to be a Scarlet Knight, visited in recent days. Always great to have a recruiting win and flip a guy from Penn State, the national champs, and obviously um, overwhelming national powerhouse in the sport. And uh, Rutgers now gets a very talented uh, young wrestler in the lightweight, uh, you know, whether it be 125 or 133 remains to be seen. But uh, another great uh, talent to add to that room. And uh, in addition, Rutgers followed up and got a uh, transfer uh, from the portal. Uh, Oregon State transfer Dagan Condomitti, also a Pennsylvania guy, uh, was at 157 uh, for the Beavers last season, but redshirted, uh, but was three-time uh, state placer in Pennsylvania, was seventh, fourth, and third in his career at Northampton. And uh, another high-level guy, 157 pounds at uh, Oregon State, remains to be seen. Somewhere in the middleweights for Rutgers, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, be interesting to see if he can compete right away. Obviously that's an area of need for, for the Scarlet Knights. They have a lot of returners next year, but, uh, the middleweights is an area. I think they could certainly, they're looking to upgrade. Uh, so a lot of great competition will be there in this room going into next season. We'll have Eric Vesper back at some point. Didn't actually get a chance to catch up with him following NCAA championships, but want to do a Rutgers wrestling update with him very soon. Also wanted to uh, shout out Epiphany Prince, one of the best players in Rutgers women's basketball history, officially retiring uh, after a uh, lengthy pro career, both in the WNBA and overseas. Uh, she was a key piece on the 2007 uh, Rutgers team that made the national title game. Uh, and uh, she had a, a big basket, basically game winning basket against Duke in the Sweet 16. She led that team in 2009 as a junior to the Sweet 16. She finished uh, over 1,500 points in her career in just three seasons, went overseas at that point early, uh, and, um, you know, had a great pro career, two-time All-Star, won NBA, uh, WNBA title, uh, and is now going to go to work for the New York Liberty in their front office, where she had a great run as a player as well. So great for her to go out on her own terms and, uh, you know, certainly uh, someone to recognize as, uh, you know, how important she was to the Rutgers women's basketball program and wishing her all the best in retirement. Now wanted to touch on Rutgers men's basketball and really focusing on the center position. You know, I've had some thoughts on it recently, just in terms of obviously the center market is, uh, you know, in terms of NIL demands and kind of some of the big names coming off now and some of the reports. I mean, it's um, very competitive in terms of NIL really high numbers being reported and being reportedly asked for by some of these candidates. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Rutgers just isn't in a position to land a top uh, center transfer right now, just in terms of where the NIL demands are. There was some official news, done some back and forth, had some discussions with, with people, and I've been reading up on it, but it was very confusing. Like, even on the NCAA site, uh, recently, uh, you know, they had contradictory information, but it is official now. It was passed on Monday by the NCAA that starting on uh, this May 1st, which was the deadline for undergrads to enter the portal. It is now the deadline for grads, postgrads to enter the portal as well. Call out the Cam Spencer rule, whatever you want. But that is huge just in terms of for the sport. I think it's, you know, it, it's tough to do it to grads. I think it was always a reward for them, you know, having graduated. But obviously, selfishly, as Rutgers fans, after getting burned by, uh, you know, Cam Spencer and, and Paul Mulcahy, both leaving after, uh, you know, late in the offseason in May and June last year, uh, it's a little bit more comforting knowing that that rule is in place now. And uh, the, what that's going to do is, right, this next week's going to be wild. You're going to see uh, some players come out that maybe were waiting it out uh, in terms of the market. Uh, it's going to help teams kind of control demand in the market in terms of, you know, uh, not uh, first of all, it's going to reduce tampering post May 1st, right? Because everyone's going to be locked in who's not in the portal. Uh, and then also it's going to allow things to shake out quicker uh, in terms of, you know, there are going to be no portal surprises late in the off season. So I think you're going to see Rutgers kind of wait it out here in this next week or so and see, see what kind of uh, develops 
Uh, there was some news on uh, Wednesday with Supreme Cook, uh, former Fairfield player under former Rutgers assistant Jay Young, uh, who was at Georgetown this last year, averaged 10.5 points, 8 rebounds a game. Uh, more uh, kind of a Steve Peichel fit just in terms of his uh, being a, a defensive first big man uh, who can rebound. Uh, so he is an intriguing name to watch. No, not saying Rutgers will pursue him. I don't know. It's too early to know. But, uh, you know, could be – uh, a, a attainable and a target uh, could be a person of interest that Rutgers might pursue here. Obviously, uh, Jay Young connections, uh, you know, can't hurt from a uh, Steve Peichel uh, perspective. And uh, that leads me back to the bigger picture in terms of what is Rutgers going to do. I've talked about how I think Lathan Somerville is definitely going to get some run early on. Is it going to be a platoon with another portal guy they bring in? You know, Emmanuel Igboli is another guy they've been high on that, you know, super raw, Obviously, as the physical attributes, you know, when I watched his tape at the Juco level, I honestly still thought physically, athletically, he reminded me of Cliff. Like, he really does. Like, he, yes, he, he's got to work on his hands. He's got to work on his skills. Um, you know, he's got to develop. But I, I do think long term, if he could stick with Rutgers, like, I, I could see him being a legit factor down the road. Can it be next season? I don't know. But um, from a size perspective, you know, like, Rutgers, Rutgers needs – Another big man. I agree. But they do have two pretty big guys now with Somerville and uh, Agbole. Uh, but I think a third big would obviously would be huge just in terms of depth. And, yes, can you get a starter out of the portal? Um, and that leads me to uh, – and, again, NIL is a huge part of this, right? The way the market is right now for top centers, the NIL is just out of uh, out of reach for, from a Rutgers perspective. And that's why you've seen them in PP patient, you know, they pursued a lot of different options in the portal. Uh, you know, a lot that haven't even come out just in terms of uh, weren't able to get visits, weren't able to get traction, but also just names they were, you know, uh, pursuing that didn't get reported. So uh, they're doing their due diligence. But I think here uh, that, um, you know, one thing that seems to be happening with Rutgers fans, and there's kind of a two camps here that I wanted to address, but one is – and I've seen this on social media, specifically Facebook, and it's just, you know, the the the, the wanting to tear down uh, what Cliff Omori did for Rutgers, you know. And and listen, Cliff had his offensive deficiencies. That is well documented. I've talked about it at length. Uh, he is not a good offensive post up player, uh, but he has a lot of really positive. I mean, he's an elite rim defender. He's an elite athlete. He's an elite dunker. He's a very good rebounder. And he played hard. He was a great teammate. Uh, and he was great in space, you know. And he, he he did a lot of really good things. And there's a reason why, with the national media, he's been in the top ten of all portal options the entire time. And, you know, revisionist history and saying, you know, I've seen comments he's not good and Rutgers doesn't want him back. And, you know, I, I hope he doesn't come back. Like, what are you talking about? Like, and I watched Field of 68 last night, and Jeff Goodman was talking, and he was asked about three or four different bigs available in the portal. And he said Cliff was the best one available because you know what you're going to get. And you do. And, um, you know, I, 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 it just it boggles my mind that when fans need to play, uh, you know, the card of saying, you know, guys that are, that are leaving the program aren't good. You know, when, it, when we're talking about Cliff Amore, one of the best bigs in the country, and Listen, he gave Rutgers everything. I mean, four years, he's going to graduate. Uh, he, he was, uh, you know, listen, uh, he didn't have the senior year he wanted, right? He didn't improve his NBA stock the way he wanted. He didn't uh, lead the team to a successful season the way he wanted. Um, him leaving, uh, again, it, it's, it's all about market value. And how can you blame someone who's going to go out there? And, you know, I think he's going to end up with high six figures. And I know he was, you know, uh, from what I've heard, I, I think he was pretty well compensated in NIL last year. Uh, but, but, you know, in terms of the demand, the market, and, and what he wants and what he, you know, kind of the market is dictating right now, uh, it's just it's, it's, it's out of Rutgers' budget, you know. And that's not to blame Rutgers. It's just the center market is out of control right now. I mean, there's, you know, reports of guys getting – 800000 of $1.2, $1.4 million. You know, it's it's wild. So for those that are discrediting him, shame on you. And for those uh, sympathetic souls that I am not trying to disparage in any way that keep trying to talk themselves into the fact that Cliff could come back. 
I just – listen, you can never say never, but it is highly unlikely. There's a lot of coping going on on social media uh, talking about how, you know, Cliff might want to come home, that, you know, he's going to see that, you know, how can he not realize he's going to play in front of NBA scouts all the time with Dylan and Ace around and how, you know, it's an ideal fit for him now and he's got to come back. And listen, you know, it's, it's, it's a business decision, you know, and if you could leave your job, right, for, you know, Money that's what four, five, six, seven, eight times more than you've ever made before, right? Who who in the right mind would not listen to that and, and explore those opportunities? And those that are saying, oh, you know, he's making a mistake and you know he's getting passed by. Listen, he's he's doing his due diligence. He he put out a list with John Rothstein last week with like twelve schools on it. He just started taking visits. He visited Georgetown this past weekend. He's reportedly at Kansas State today. He's reportedly visiting Alabama this weekend. I mean, these are big time programs. I, I I know I know the you know inferiority complex of Kansas State. You know, Rutgers should be able to compete with them. I mean, listen, you know, they made an elite eight two years ago. Jerome, T- Jerome Tang has a lot of juice. Uh, th- there's NIO money there, you know. And uh, listen, Cliff should explore whatever he wants to explore. And him not coming back to Rutgers isn't a negative on Rutgers, and it shouldn't be a negative on Cliff. I just think that those are hoping he's going to come back. I you know listen. I don't want to kill hope, keep hope alive if you want, but it's just a very unlikely scenario. Uh, and and just because, and, and these things in life, right? Life is not black and white. Everything's gray. So just because from our perspective, he'd be a perfect fit back for Rutgers, doesn't mean that's reality in his mind. And you can't fault him for that. You know, you got, you, you got to, we got to let it go. That's, that's my take on it. I, I just think that, um, you know, it, it's, uh, Rutgers is going to find a center and sure it'd be great to have the roster wrapped up, but you have to let things play out. And I've talked about this before that you have to let the market play out because you might end up in a situation. I mean, there are not 50 programs that are going to pay out high six figures for a center, but there might be 50 big men that want that. That might not be actually valued that right. But maybe you get a top 30 guy that was holding out for a big time offer. And all of a sudden the well dried up because those programs have have found their guys. Right. And Rutgers can swoop in. You never know. Uh, So I, I, and I also, again, I think that maybe some expectations that people like, I think expectations are out of whack because you have expectations that Cliff's not good enough and they need to get a, a better big, but Cliff is a top five big in the portal. Like, who do you want? Omar Ballo from Arizona, who's going to Indiana now? Like, if if Cliff isn't good enough and you want a big-time center, then you're talking about, like, two or three guys, you know, that, that would fulfill that. You know, and Amari Williams is a big name. He's going to Kentucky. So, I think it all stems from a positive, right? Because hope is high. Expectations are high, as they should be. You get two, two All-Americans, two of the top five, two, top three players – in recruiting class uh, coming in that are projected top five lottery picks. Uh, and Dylan Hopper, I've talked about it at length. I don't need to go into it, but he, he's special. He's different. He's experienced level at this stage in his career. And then Ace, obviously, you know, I mean, listen, he has uh, top pick potential from a talent perspective. Uh, and then, you know, I think what they've done in the portal is they, they've, they, they're, it's all about fit. And you get a top 10 national scorer in Tyson Acuff. You get uh, a, a sharp shooting uh, big that can stretch the floor. That played in the Sweet 16, Zach Martini. You have a, a versatile player of the year and player, a defensive player of the year from their own conference coming in. Uh, so it, it, we're talking about Dur- Durkak. Uh, and, and obviously the search continues, right? And they had J. Don Jones visit recently, uh, you know, root for Butler in Oklahoma to st- stock up on guards and wings. Uh, Oklahoma got a guard commitment recently. Per- Butler's pursuing another one. Uh, he's supposedly going to, you know, potentially visit both of them. Not a ton of other names linked to him. I found Mississippi State somewhere in terms of social media, their fan base saying that they were interested in him, uh, like the program had reached out or whatnot. But um, we'll see. We'll see. If they can land a Jadon Jones in terms of, you know, a 3 and D guy, I think they need to fill that profile. The way Rutgers wants to play, they don't want to get a big that can post up 15 times a game. You know, they need a big that can operate in space that can stretch the floor. And honestly, they're, they – even if it's not a top name, they might find a, a, a center that plays a style that fits 
better with what they want to do offensively because they want to space the floor. Cliff is not a guy that is comfortable on the perimeter. And, you know, I, I just think things can still work out in a way that can benefit this team in the long run. And, you know, you have to wish Cliff well. And I, and I understand the fantasy of wanting him back. And listen, if it worked out, it would be unbelievable. You take him back in a heartbeat. But it's just funny to me that people complain about the deficiencies of Cliff. And it's like, the, you know, you talk bad about his game. But, yo, that's why he should come back here. Well, okay. Like, you want him back, but he's not good enough to leave. Like, it doesn't, you know, I, I just, I guess it's coping. I don't know. I'm not trying to be like get off my lawn. I probably sound like it. I'm getting grumpier in my old age. I recently, uh, you know, passed the moon for another year. And uh, so that's uh, just my little rant there. But I think, you know, wish Cliff well. He got us to, and it goes back to COVID, right? I mean, if COVID never happened, Cliff is done, right? I would not have this opportunity. Paul would have ended his career at Rutgers. Uh, Moat Mag would have ended his career. Uh, no word on him, but, you know, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of high major interest there. That'll be interesting to see where he lands. Uh, so we'll just have to see. But in terms of uh, – and also, oh, Antoine Wolfolk, I forgot to mention, landed at Miami of Ohio. He's going to the MAC. So you have uh, Derek Simpson now at St. Joe's. You have Wolf at Miami of Ohio. You have Antonio Chol at Howard. And you have Gavin Griffiths at Nebraska. Um you know, I think Nebraska is a good landing spot for Griffiths. I don't think that that was ever part of the plan. I don't think that, you know, uh, East Coast guy uh, ever had a plan to go to Nebraska. But I, And they just uh, got Connor Asigian as well from Wisconsin. So be interesting to see what kind of minutes Gavin gets there. But I do think offensively it's a good system for him. And, uh, you know, defensively it is not really a major focus there. Hoiberg is a great coach. So good for him. Good for everybody that left, you know, be happy for them. And let's be happy for who Rutgers has coming in and let's wait and see. I know patience is virtue. Patience is tough right now. I do think with the May 1st deadline, we're going to have a little bit of wait here. Uh, but Rutgers has two spots to fill. They have an opportunity. Like I said, Bart Torvik's projections, I said this in a recent podcast, has Rutgers analytically ranked 24th as the roster is constructed right now. Obviously, other teams are still building as well. St. John's just landed their first transfer, by the way. Seton Hall's got seven guys in the portal. Like, this is just life in college basketball now. This is not a Rutgers problem. This is an everyone reality. Welcome to college basketball in 2024. Stick with us here at the Scarlet Faithful. Appreciate everyone listening and watching once again. And I'll talk to you tomorrow.